And welcome to tonight's panel discussion, Plastics, Recycle, Reuse, Refuse. I'm Carolyn Platt, the panel moderator for our co-sponsors, the Acton Area League of Women Voters and Green Acton. And John Sonner is our Zoom host. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that supports policies, not candidates or political parties, through civic education and advocacy at a local, state, and national level. Green Acton is a nonprofit environmental advocacy organization that works to protect and enhance Acton's environment and to help resolve environmental issues that transcend Acton's boundaries. Tonight is the second in a series of three panel discussions our local league is sponsoring this year. The final panel will host police chiefs from Acton, Boxborough, Maynard, Stowe, and Littleton. They'll discuss the effects of COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter movement on community policing with plenty of time for questions. See the chat for more information on this March 10th event. This is a Zoom webinar so you'll only be seeing the panel and the moderator. Note that there are separate icons on the bottom of your screen for Q&A and for chat. We welcome your questions on Q&A and we'll be posting resources on the chat. So please don't use the chat for questions. So our registration is over 200 people. This tells me that plastic is on our minds. Much of the plastic in this world is used just once and only about 9% gets recycled. The vast majority is accumulating in landfills or burned in incinerators. Landfills and incinerators are disproportionately located near communities of color and low income populations. The plastic pollution is not just a litter or oceans issue. It's a climate issue and it's a human health issue. Disturbingly, plastic never goes away. Finally, lest we forget, in selected uses, there is no better material than plastic, but what we don't need is plastic waste. Our first speaker tonight is Ben Harvey, the president of E.L. Harvey Waste and Recycling Service. Ben's presentation on recycling will start with his short video tour of E.L. Harvey Materials Recovery Facility, better known as a MRF, showing what happens to recycling when it leaves the transfer station. Then he'll join us in person to talk about final destination of plastics, challenges and trends, and also tell us about a valuable and handy source for finding out what can and what can't be recycled. Okay, we're ready for the video. Hi. I'm Ben Harvey, president and one of the owners of E.L. Harvey & Sons, one of the nation's leading trash and recycling businesses located in the heart of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. E.L. Harvey is a hundred-year-old company and for over half of a century we have offered innovative recycling services to our numerous client companies before recycling was ever popular. We are proud to be one of the forerunners in this area and continue to bring the newest innovations to life in the recycling world. One of our primary goals has been to lead the implementation of technology to enhance and improve recycling, which we have executed with great success. Nationally renowned for our capabilities and ability to get results for our clients in numerous industries, we continue to seek ways of bringing groundbreaking practices to our industry to lead with best practices in waste management and recycling. E.L. Harvey has always been innovative in all recycling practices. You will see that our new single stream operation is evidence of our strong commitment to recycling. It is my pleasure to show you our newest single stream recycling building. Please join me on this tour and thank you for your interest. I 
behind me you will see what is typical for a single stream recycling facility. As I said before, it's a very mechanized system. The material comes in all mixed together, then it goes through a series of screens, of floats, of mechanical and uh, manual separation to get the products that we want. So we're going to try to walk through the system and walk through the steps that we take here in Westboro to make a recyclable product at the end of the day. Behind me, you see a normal pile of single stream recycling that is coming in from other municipalities. The material comes in all mixed together. It goes to the metering bin to my left. The metering bin puts a nice level layer of material on the inbound conveyor that goes up to our first picking sorting area. From there, the material goes through a set of screens, which hopefully we'll be able to show you in a moment. So this is our first pre-sort. And what we attempt to do here is take out materials that are too big to go through the system. If you've thrown small appliances or pails, five gallon pails, or other types of plastics, uh, film plastic, that might hurt our system or do damage to our system, this is what comes out first. And then the material continues to flow through the rest of the system. After it goes through the pre-sort, it goes through a set of screens that pulls out the larger pieces of cardboard. You can see the cardboard that kind of hops up on top of the screens. All of the other material, including newspaper, cereal boxes, bottles, cans, everything else falls down through the screens and it goes on to another conveyor to take it into another process. Also at this point that we cannot see is where the glass is broken and, and uh, into smaller pieces and then that goes out into a stockpile to send away for, to glass recycling. The, ma the material that's on the conveyor that you're looking at now is the material that came out of the first two screens, the cardboard screens. This is again going through a series of mechanical separation where the bottles and the cans are separated from all of the other fiber. The fiber goes onto a quality control conveyor. The bottles and cans go onto another conveyor and continue through the process. We actually have two sets of screen here. One that takes out the larger paper and then another one we call a polishing screen to get out whatever fiber is left in the, in the system. So after it goes to these two screens, the containers come up on that end conveyor over there, goes through the magnet, and then comes back down this conveyor where here everything is hand sorted. So it's a, what we call a positive pick. So each one of these guys has a different responsibility on the material that they're sorting out. And the only thing that's left on the belt as it, as it goes the rest of the way is trash and PET and aluminum because we have a, a mechanical separation it's actually an optical sorter which which recognizes the plastic resin and kicks out the PET and then the aluminum we have a reverse eddy current that kicks out the aluminum they also they do have optical sorters for the other plastics but because of the cost we didn't put them in but eventually we probably will where PET which is the soda bottles, that's the uh, highest volume of the container line. That's why we put the uh, optical on the PET sorter. So the, the soda bottles and water bottles are the ones that I was talking about that will go through an optical sorter. And it, what it does, it goes through a, a scan with a lot of light and it will pick up the resin and it will blow it off to the side and separate it out that way. It's, it's quite a system. The material that's being fed onto the baler feed conveyor now are tin cans that have been separated by a magnet. This is our baler infeed, and these bunkers beside us here all have different fiber materials in them. You can see the paper, the cardboard, and when those materials, when those bunkers are full, we open up these uh, doors, that material comes out on the feed conveyor, and then it's fed into our baler, the baler makes bales that weigh approximately 15 to 2,000, 1,500 to 2,000 pounds each, and from there, where they're loaded onto trailers and shipped to mills. The material that's blowing in the air here is paper that we're blowing off of our glass line. Because we want to keep the residue, we want to keep our glass as much glass as possible. 
So we try to get the NGR, which is non-glass residue, out. And we're doing that by a fan. Most of this paper is from people that have home shredding systems and shred all of their documents and then put it into recycle. We do recycle this paper after it goes through the blowing system. So, so we've, we've, we've come full circle in the system. We've come from the beginning where we had all of the stuff mixed together to the end of the line where we have all of this product that is now ready to be shipped to the consuming mills throughout the world. The mixed fiber is going to mills in China. The cardboard is going to mills locally, uh, most of it to upstate New York. The PET containers are going to facilities down in the south of the United States. Uh, there's a couple of mills in North Carolina that use that. Uh, the, the mixed color, high density polyethylene, all those nice pretty colors. And we will ship that to uh, another plastics sorter and they'll run that through that optical so they'll get the polypropylene out, they'll get the uh, whatever uh, high density polyethylene is left in there, whatever PET, they'll just break everything down into its individual uh, plastics. I hope you enjoyed the tour of our newest single stream recycling operation. We okay, Ben, it's nice to see you in person. <laughs> Why don't you continue? Okay, well, first of all, I want to tell you my voice, I couldn't talk after I got that tour done, shouting over the equipment, as you could hear. Um, a couple of things um, I just want to talk about today. Um, that facility right now is handling approximately 350 tons a day of recycled single stream material from communities, uh, mostly in the 495 belt, uh, where we're located in Westboro, so it's, it's close into our location but we do bring material as far away as the Cape up to our facility. Of that 350 tons a day, as I mentioned, a very small part of that is plastics, but we do try to get as much of the plastics out of the, uh, of the single stream as we can. Um, the, right now we're doing about, of that 350 tons a day, about seven tons of that is um, high density polyethylene natural, which is water bottles, milk bottles, the milk jugs and stuff like that, opaque color. Another, another about seven tons a day of the mixed color, which is your deter detergent, uh, mixed color high density polyethylene, which is your colored um, laundry detergent, dishwashing detergent, that type of material. And then about, about 10 and a half to 11 tons a day is PET, which is your water bottles and your soda bottles. And um, so, it's a small fraction of the total 350 tons a day that we bring in, but it's an important part. It's part of the whole stream. Um, uh, we, we um, let me see, that material we come in, we are, we're mostly now charging municipalities to handle single stream recycling only because of the decline in the markets and most of the markets into China for our bulk grades, not so much the plastic grades, but for our bulk grades. And so we, we are charging municipalities to bring in and process their single stream recyclables. Um, as you saw in the video, um, we've invested, our company and a lot of companies, a lot the industry has invested a lot in processing equipment to handle single stream recycling. I mentioned that we've been in this business for over 50 years. I've been doing it myself for Oh, yeah, okay, almost 50 years myself. And um, the technology today is unbelievable. That system there is about six years old, and that technology is being outdated. We're looking to update that equipment now. Um, let me see, I'm just trying to go through. Oh, um, I, I was going to talk about what COVID has done. COVID has increased the volume of single stream recycling, also increased the, the volume of waste generated in the home, but has increased the volume of single stream recycling because more and more people are home. They're eating at home, they're drinking at home, they're consuming more products at home. And so we have seen a increase in our PET uh, soda bottle line. We've seen an increase, not that we're talking about that tonight, but I'll bring it up on our UBC container line. Um, another, another part of this is during the beginning of the COVID, people did not want to go to redemption centers to take their their plastics and their cans back. So they put them in the recycling bin. Uh, so we have seen an increase and we have also seen an increase in all of our recyclables. 
Um, we, our markets right now are pretty much the same as I mentioned in the video. Our PET soda bottles go mostly for carpet down to Virginia and Georgia. Our uh, mixed um, plastics, our mixed HD, mixed color HDPE goes to a company called KW Plastics that's down and I believe they're in Alabama as is, is our natural. Um, I, we have seen a tremendous increase in the um, marketability of these materials in the last year, if not two years. There is a demand right now, and, and I'm sure that Eric can get into this later on as he talks about uh, sourcing material for his facility. Um, let me see. Uh, challenges. We, oh, I met, before I go any further, and I'd run out of time here. If there are any questions on what is recyclable and what is not, Mass DEP has a Recycle Smart webpage that you can go to. We worked in conjunction with Mass DEP to put this together to, to easily identify the materials that our single stream plants can handle. So if you have any questions, and I don't care whether you're sending your material to E.L. Harvey, to Waste Management, to Republic, um, we, we all kind of agreed on these are the things that our plants can handle right now. We do look at new, um, new materials that come in. I mentioned we pull the films off early on. The film market has been an up and a down. Um, we try to take advantage. We need to market the materials. We can't just collect it and put it in a warehouse. We need to have markets for it. Again, that's a market that's, that's increasing right now. There is a small percentage, even in our facility, that does go off the end of the line that we do not have markets for, that we, that we have to send off for disposal, but we try to recycle as much, much material as we can. Um, I, some of the challenges we have are contamination. Some of the challenges we have with plastics are multi-layered plastics. Um, we, we ran into a problem a couple of years ago with, um, with soda bottles they were making out of a plant-based derivative, water bottles and soda bottles. That cannot be recycled with the PET, but it looks the same. Our machines don't know the difference. So it was very difficult at that time. Our employees don't know the difference. They go by recognition. So it was very hard at that time to separate out the plant-based PET type material from the regular uh, PET that could be recycled. Uh, let's see. Uh, state and national trends, we look to see a lot more optical sorters like you saw at our plant. And the other thing that's becoming very, very popular today is robotics. Um, as I said, that plant's six years old. We're looking to upgrade a lot of the equipment that's in there now. We would like to put in robotics. It's very expensive to do that, but we feel that investing in that gives us the opportunity to extract better quality material and more material at the same time. And uh, I know we're gonna have questions later on. I'll, I'll, I'll leave myself some room to answer some questions. Thank you for your time tonight. Carolyn? Well, thank you. Um, so it's really interesting that all the uh, MRFs worked with the um, Department of Environmental Protection to set the criteria for what can be recycled and what can't be. And you mentioned that uh, Recycle Smart site, which is good. And in addition, for Acton residents, we are recommending a Talking Trash and Recycling in Acton, which is a webinar set for March 18th by the town of Acton and Keep Massachusetts Beautiful. So thank you. And it's also good to know where some of these things are going and, and uh, being reused. Appreciate it. Okay, we now move to the topic of reusing plastics. And I'd like to introduce Eric Hudson, the CEO and founder of Preserve. Since 1996, Preserve has made sustainable products that are good for both people and the planet. At Preserve, they use number five and number two recycled plastic to create houseware and other products in order to reduce dependence on virgin plastic and to encourage recycling. And while I'm at it, I'm gonna take a sip of water from one of, uh, <laughs> one of Eric's. Okay. They also make products from plant-based biodegradable materials and have won best for the earth in the B Corps award system for eight years in a row. That's great. Eric will talk about 
some of Preserve's initiatives, including a Gimme 5 program on hold due to COVID and the Preserve Ocean Plastic Initiative. <clears throat> he will share how Preserve uses a life cycle assessment approach to assess the impact of their products and he'll explain their commitment to playing a role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2030. So finally, to show plastic is not all bad, Eric will discuss the role plastic plays in reducing carbon, carbon emissions. So Eric, you're on. Thank you, Carolyn, very much. Um, thank you everybody for joining tonight. Um, just to make the connection, Ben and I knew each other uh, many years ago working on the Mass Recycle Board. So it's great to see Ben again and Janet and I know each other as well from the industry. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I want to start just briefly and say that, uh, give you a, a brief on Preserve's founding. Um, I'm a Massachusetts resident uh, almost all the way through, grew up in the Berkshires and started Preserve, uh, originally called Recycline Inc., uh, on Beacon Hill and the main, and then I quickly moved over to Cambridge because I thought that was a greener address. So we, we did that uh, lickety split. Um, the main purpose of our company is to show that we can make products that are lighter on the earth uh, and also highly functional. Um, so that there's no sacrifice in the functionality and they can be a lower greenhouse gas product. Um, First and foremost, that is done by making products from recycled materials, essentially reusing Earth's resources, capturing the natural gas that's in that plastic that Ben's process recycles and turns into something that a company like Preserve can source and make a product out of. Um, we make five different categories of products. We make toothbrushes, razors, tableware, food storage, and kitchen products. And we also have a food service line now. Um, about seven years, eight years into the company, which we founded in 1997, uh, we started to hear more and more from consumers, uh, probably knocking on Ben's door first, and then knocking on the door of someone like Preserve, originally in Somerville and now in Waltham, saying, you know, I love what you guys are doing, but I still can't recycle my yogurt cup. And, and what are you going to do about it? Uh, so we started a program called Give Me Five. And that Give Me Five program primarily through partners like Whole Foods Market, takes back number five, give me five bin, and then feeds through into our system in which we then reprocess it. Uh, in essence, you know, sort of the step beyond bins, we take it into a uh, reprocessing facility. There's one called Aaron in Lemonster, and they grind up those yogurt cups and they turn it into a, a flake and then some of these guys actually will turn it then into a pellet and we source that pellet and we then can process it in our manufacturing facilities uh, in our partners manufacturing facilities. Uh, we have a, a key partner based in Lemonster as well. Um, one of our manufacturing uh, partners. Um, so the Gimme 5 program, uh, you know, over, over all the years has been more successful than not. Uh, we definitely have had municipal uh, programs call us and say, you know, I don't process number twos. I don't know what to do with them. And can you, sorry, and, and number fives, and can you take those? Um, so we have had discussions with towns about the potential to source number five plastics. Uh, and then we also work with companies on take back programs. Um, for instance, Preserve has had a take back program since we started the company. We take all of our products back and we turn them into something else. And Gimme 5 became the vehicle for that. But we also worked with companies like Stonyfield Farm and Brita and Pacifica to recycle their products in their take back program and then turn those into products at Preserve. And those can range, the products that we can make can range from our razor um, or our toothbrush but they also can become um, less sort of sexy uh, materials like a brick or a pipe, um, depending on how, you know, potentially how contaminated the materials when it comes back to us. Um, the Gimme 5 program has been difficult to keep going in the last year and a half, and we're seeking to, you know, really um, uh, reinvigorate it, re re rebirth it uh, as we move out of uh, COVID, hopefully, slowly but surely. 
Um, mostly it's been an issue as it relates to um, our partners and their ability to take back materials in the stores. As you may know, you know, a lot of the plastic bags were not allowed to be recycled in stores recently. As well, of course, we couldn't even use reusable uh, bags. Uh, sorry, re yeah, reusable bags. And fortunately, uh, we're beyond that stage of COVID. So people have become much more comfortable with that um, surface level, lack of surface level transmission of the virus. Um, I want to also uh, talk about a couple of key things. We recently took a, a next step with our, our mission. And not only are we sourcing recycled materials from partners uh, like one step uh, down the supply chain from Ben, um, but are also, and from our Give Me Five program, uh, in, in, in small part, we do still take the mail in from Give Me Five, but we also have what's called the Preserve Ocean Plastics Initiative now. So about two years ago, we said to ourselves, how can we help with this issue? And we basically came to the resolution that we're better at prevention than we are at remediation. So we don't want to be in the, you know, the activities of, or we didn't think we were capable of being the activities of trying to help, uh, you know, basically uh, screening the plastics out of the ocean, but we wanted to help prevent the plastics from getting into the ocean. Um, I'm sure a lot of folks have done research uh, on this issue and, and understand the causes of it. Um, but 10 of the uh, largest rivers in the world are uh, are creating most of the or eighty percent of the plastics that are going in the ocean from riverways, which is primarily how oceans uh, sorry plastics get into the oceans. Um, and we are sourcing uh, some of that material with partners uh, in which pickers are out there picking the plastics from coastal areas or from tributaries, feeding into rivers, and we're bringing that through with our partner Envision in California. And we're turning it into a material to make uh, the handles of our of our poppy razor and our poppy toothbrush. Um, we also give 25% of our proceeds to uh, nonprofit uh, partners, which has been really fun. And uh, the proceeds are growing, so it's it's exciting to try to figure out okay, who's the next nonprofit partner we can support? Five Gyres has been our number one partner to date. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, one of the key things we're seeking to do as a business, and I gotta look at John's uh, timer here, um, is that we uh, recently uh, realized that the biggest impact or lack of impact we can, we can have is to become a zero carbon, net zero uh, company. Uh, by 2030, but we're we're I'm, we're going to far exceed that. Uh, we're already working really hard on it now, and I think by 2023 we will be net zero. Um, that's really exciting, and we think that this uh, step by consumer products companies as well as all companies globally can be a significant uh, front that businesses can uh, contribute to. Uh, reducing our greenhouse ga gas emissions, of course. Um, you know, of course, the, 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 the countries and the nations are coming through in the Paris Accord. Um, many companies have come through and we're still in it when, when we went out of the Paris Accord for a while. Um, and we love the steps that companies are taking to say, you know, tactically and strategically, we are going to either offset or we're going to source renewables or we're going to reduce or we're going to reuse. Uh, and we're going to take steps to make sure that we're a net zero company. So that's very exciting. And that parlays a bit into uh, one of the key things I want to talk tonight about is, um, you know, plastics get slammed. There's no question. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, presentations that we do, um, we talk about, you know, kind of the, uh, you know, the air that comes into the room. We start talking about plastics. There's this negativity. There's no question there's a negativity. There's a, 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 an end of life problem and it's contaminating our oceans, as we all know. I don't, I don't need to go through the stats. Um, I've got them right here. We can talk more about those. Um, but there's hope. Uh, you know, there, there are efforts that we can take to prevent plastics from getting into the ocean. And Five Gyres, which is a uh, you know, strong anti-plastic advocate and partner of ours, you know, also looks to the hope side and knows that if we reduce the plastics that go into the ocean by 20% every year, in seven years, we're going to get to a level of 1990 levels, 1990 levels of plastic in the ocean. And that's a level in which the, plas the ocean was able to handle the plastics in the ocean. 
Um, and I, I don't want to overstate that because none of us want any plastics in the ocean, but in, in essence, it came to a state of homeostasis where you didn't see beaches of plastics all over the place. You didn't see waves and surfers of plastics raining in on them. Uh, and that's a much better place than we are here today. In essence, the ocean can process that plastic and deal with it. And we don't have the uh, negative, strong negative effects on marine animals. Um, I also wanted to, you know, just highlight that when we look at plastics, I think, you know, most of us know on this call and this webinar that they are the right choice, as Carolyn mentioned, as it relates to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Just forgetting about end of life for a second. If you're going to design a plane, a car, a train, uh, something that carries yogurt across the country and brings it to your home, a, a thin walled polypropylene plastic cup is far better than glass or steel. Uh, and of course, we tried to design planes that were all steel, all metals, uh, they might not get off the ground. Um, so there is a place for plastics. We're all looking at plastics right now in our computers. Um, of course, there's a, a, an argument to be made to reusables, okay, if we can be durable, I get it, that's more of a place for plastics. When we go into the single use area, let's find better solutions. So whether that's better recovery or on the front side, of course, redesigning products so they reduce uh, from a packaging standpoint, from a uh, product standpoint, making them more recyclable, as Ben was talking about, you know, the issues with the, the, the plant-based PET bottle and sort of the Franken plastics that can be created. Um, designing for recyclability is key, uh, but I'd also say that making products and really investing in the innovation needed around new materials uh, is key. Uh, and at Preserve, we're really, really focused on that. So one of the key materials we like, sorry, I have one right here earlier, I was eating uh, my dinner on a PHA fork. And um, you know, PHA is a material sort of beyond PLA, and it is a plant-based material and it's home compostable. Um, and we think it can get to a point where it is uh, benign enough to be marine degradable. And it can also get to a point, we believe, whether that's PHA or a, a next level material from PHA, where it's actually a nutritious you know, treat potentially for marine animals. So. No one wants these plastics to run astray and find its way to the ocean, but if they do, let's design them made from materials that uh, are not harmful to marine animals or to uh, the oceans. Um, so with that, I think I will pause and I'm looking forward to the discussion ahead. Um, I don't think there's any key points I missed, but Carolyn, if you think I did, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, continue on. Well, you, you mentioned the uh, life cycle assessment. Yes, great, great, great point. Um, so when we talk about the footprint of uh, plastics, um, you know, Preserve has made our products from recycled plastics ever since the first days. And, and we don't exist here to make products from virgin plastics. We make products from reused materials, from recycled plastics. And in doing so, and also in light weighting um, our packaging or making our products reusable, um, we also seek to investigate, study, and measure the full life cycle of that product, both from its origins to its second life. And we'd like to spend a lot more money on this if we could, but it's called a life cycle assessment, which many of you may be aware of, but really looking at the, the impact and the greenhouse gas emissions of your product from uh, its first days in sourcing the materials that you put into your product, um, originally the mining of those materials potentially, uh, and then the manufacturing process, and then the second life afterwards, or potentially going to landfill if that's where it ends up. So these life cycle assessments have really become something that a lot of companies are utilizing, um, using science to make sure that they're trying to uh, design their products to be as light as possible. And in essence, on a very high level, if you look at using recycled materials versus using virgin materials, if you look at using recycled polypropylene versus virgin polypropylene, you're having about 50% less uh, emissions in that product 
with that product and you're also uh, utilizing 50% less resources like water in the production of that product. So again, we'd love to be doing much more life cycle assessment. Uh, it, is, it is expensive to hire um, and we hope to be uh, you know, measuring all aspects of our business going forward. Fortunately, the net zero assessment um, is really more of a holistic look at our entire operations. Um, and, and each of our products are, are included in there, but we don't have to kind of break out, uh, you know, what's the impact of each one of our products. We have, you know, over 50 now. So it can be, uh, again, expensive to do that on a product by product basis. And when you do it on a more holistic basis as it relates to all your transportation and all your manufacturing, and then also all the use and the potential disposal of your products, uh, it's a bit more uh, economical. Wow. Well, who would think from holding a toothbrush that there's all this, all this thinking and creativity, and I would say a lot of encouraging um, things that are happening. Um, I congratulate you. If you get to 2023 net zero, um, I'd like to come to the party. <laughs> so let us know. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. So now I am most pleased to welcome our last panelist, Janet Dominitz, the Executive Director of MassPerg. MassPerg stands up to powerful interests by advocating for the public interest in many areas, including tonight's topic, zero waste. MassPerg believes, and I quote, it's time to move beyond single use plastic by getting rid of the most harmful waste and stopping the use of things we truly don't need. So Janet will update us on the recently filed plastic bills in the Mass Legislature, and she'll tell how we can give important input to the Mass Department of Environmental Protection on their solid waste master plan draft. And she'll also talk about PERG's national campaign against Whole Foods to get rid of single-use plastic in its stores. So Janet, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Uh, just to follow up on the last comment, I want to go to any party, please. When are parties coming back? <laughs> right. Sooner the better. Um, well, this is a party. Let's consider this a party. There's 120 of us here. So this is our Thursday night party. And thank you for having me. Um, as Carolyn said, I'm Janet Dominitz. I'm the director of MassPerg. And I'm a little behind Ben. I just celebrated my 40 years at MassPerg. So um, I have a little catching up to do. But, um, but Ben and I are roughly in the same generation. So uh, I'd like to talk about three things tonight. Um, first of all, I want to give you a little bit of background or theory to what we mean by uh, zero waste, which is what we are uh, promoting. Secondly, as Carolyn mentioned, tell you a little bit about our state campaigns. And third, mention our national campaigns. And I'm looking at the time to make sure I stay within my allotment. Um, so starting with our theory, our roadmap for zero waste, I'll take a moment of personal privilege and say that I grew up with um, a grandmother who was born in 1901, one of my favorite humans ever, who used to say to us, enough is too much. And I can't say that I got that when I was seven years old, but now I live it and I hope every day that she here's what we're doing because it is all about that sentiment and that sensibility. Um, my dad was a World War II veteran. He used to say to us, like, in any occasion, you know, waste not, want not. So, I mean, I was 12 years old for the first Earth Day in 1970, wrote the poem, you know, really had in my DNA this notion uh, that we shouldn't waste before it became, before the environmentalism was even a word. So that's my own background. In terms of our organization, I just wanna um, step back for a second, again, to give some context. Uh, I wanna read something for a moment that uh, recently, maybe, maybe you saw this as well. A new analysis that was recently published in the journal Nature poses this. The year 2020 will likely be the year when human-made mass 
surpasses the overall weight of biomass, which is basically living things on the, on the planet. That is estimated to be, and this it has 11 zeros. So I'm just going to say 1.1 teratons. That's with one R. A milestone that speaks to the enormous impact that humans have had on the planet. On average, the researchers estimate that materials, including concrete, bricks, asphalt, metals, plastic, wood, and glass, that outweigh the body weight of every person on the planet are being produced each week. So that's just like sets the stage. Then you think about the United, that sets the stage for the planet. Then we come into the United States, we're 4% of the population of the planet, and we generate 12% of the world's waste. That waste, when we say waste, it's kind of like an abstract concept, but waste goes two places, landfills and incinerators. We do not have the time tonight to make the laundry list of all the pollution that comes from landfills and incinerators. I don't think I'm overstating to say that there is nothing good about either of those things. Then we bring it home to Massachusetts where we are generating something a little over five and a half million tons of waste each year and our progress has, has flattened. If anything, it might've gotten a little worse. The most recent numbers, I believe from DEP are from the Department of Environmental Protection, which I will now call a DEP. Um, I believe they're 2018. Um, so, so that's, I just wanted to paint that somber picture and then talk for a moment about how plastics fit in here and then move on, as I said, to number two and number three, what we're doing about it on a state level and a national level. So plastics, and this number may have been mentioned already, if I'm repeating, I'm sorry, but 8.3 billion tons of plastic have been produced since 1950. And half of that is in the last 15 years. So that's to give a little context, you know, somehow we did have modern civilization before plastics. I am not advocating that we go back to 1948, but I am trying to just give a little context for plastics in our modern, in our modern life. Uh, I know Carolyn said this earlier, it bears repeating that less than 10% of plastic has ever been recycled. So I don't want to discount those numbers on the bottom of the containers. They, are, of course, are important. But the fact is, if, if we just like take that one step back, less than 10% of all plastic ever produced has actually been recycled. Um, a third note there is we have to also look at the front end because even if we could wave a magic wand when we were done with X plastic item and it would just disappear into fairy dust. The fact is that making that plastic also has severe polluting implications. It's mostly made from petrochemicals. I just took a class the other night. There's a plant being built right now in Pennsylvania to, um, to take fracked gas and turn it into plastics. They're wanting to make more plastic. I mean, the, con the making of plastic with petroleums is enabling fossil fuels and a lot more polluting problems in our state, in our country, on our planet. So at our organization, our theory, our jumping off point, our promoting zero waste is that we make too much stuff, that we generate too much waste. And there, if you look at plastics, that's a simple place. I don't mean easy, but it is a simple, straightforward place, a logical one and an extremely important one to start to turn this sinking ship in a plastic filled ocean around. So that's just a little bit of context, uh, you know, how we, how we see the world. So that's number one. Number two is, so what are we doing about all that? Uh, if you are familiar with the legislative process in Massachusetts, 
then I will be repeating what you already know, which is our sessions started on the first Wednesday of January. So a um, little about a month and a half ago. Uh, the bill filing deadline just ended four days ago, Friday, February 19th was the deadline for filing bills. So we're still sorting through the thousands of bills that have been filed, but I would like to talk about some of them. Before I do that, um, I just, again, want to give you sort of like my, my um, approach to all these campaigns. There is no one silver bullet. So I have, I have favorite bills that I love working on, but we're not going to solve the problem of waste and, and plastic pollution with any one bill. There's no one way to do it. That's number one. Number two, and again, this is my personal privilege to say this, I like the focus on legislation over lifestyle. And I feel like I get into conversations with people where I, you know, their entire, every ounce of energy and focus and commitment that they have ends up going into, you know, worrying about like, I have to do all this research to decide, do I buy Stonyfield or do I buy Dannon? And what should I have in my refrigerator? And it, is my shopping habit better than my neighbor? You know, it's like people get really understandably focused on what they're doing every day. But I have spent 40 years looking at, you know, how do we make the systems work? How do we change the infrastructure? How do we influence our decision makers literally in the public interest? And so I'm not somebody who advocates, you know, buying a car that goes five miles a gallon or anything. But on the other hand, I like to focus on legislation over lifestyle. So that's where we're coming from. And then the third thing that I'll just mention in terms of the advocacy work that we do is keep your eyes wide open as to who's opposing these measures. And I'll, I'll give you an anecdote on that in a moment. So on the state level, um, in no particular order, we have relaunched this year uh, and just filed on Friday our campaign to update the state's bottle bill, the deposit law. Um, we have put some new measures in there. The, the deposit has been a nickel since 1983. If you can show me anything else that costs the same that it does in 1983, I'd love to see it, but we wanna double that deposit to 10 cents. We want to include every container. I was I was cringing a little bit at l watching um, Ben's video because there's not a single beverage container that should be on that conveyor belt. We know how to do this and we should do it for water bottles and we should do it for iced tea and we should do it for all those single use beverages that a lot of which end up as litter or um as trash. So we've got a new bottle bill. We've got the, we've refiled the bill to ban single use plastic bags. Um, there are 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts. 141 of them tired of waiting for the state legislature have moved on their own to ban single use plastic bags in their towns or cities. And we should do it statewide. It's beyond time, it's late. Um, there is a bill to establish what we call right to repair. 8,000 cell phones a day in Massachusetts get tossed. And a lot of that is because we're not given the tools or the schematics, the directions anymore as to how to repair our own stuff. Or Apple makes the battery glued in so you can't just lift it out and put in a new one. Um, there's legislation filed to give us as consumers right to repair our electronics. There's a bill filed this year um, to get producers to be responsible for their products like we've done in other states with paint and mattresses and other polluting items. And then I wanna mention, Carolyn said that the Department of Environmental Protection, as a result of a law that we helped pass in the 80s, every 10 years has to issue what's called a solid waste master plan. It's basically a blueprint for how we're going to deal with waste for the next decade. They can't do all of it on their own. Some they have the authority to do, some they're just recommending to the legislature or to cities and towns, but they have to have this blueprint, which is a really important um, document and reference point. And we are asking them to make it a zero waste master plan. 
Um, so those are just a few places where if you want to get involved in changing policy on a state level, I mean, there's plenty more, but I just wanted to feature a few. And then we're lucky enough, MassPerg, to be part of a national network of state PERGs, and we often um, combine forces to take on national targets, one of which is Whole Foods, um, an organization called As You Sow, that's S-O-W, which is like an activist think tank, put out a report recently on major retail chains and their practices around plastic, and they gave Whole Foods an F, like in failing. And while Whole Foods was a leader some years ago and were one of the first to ban single-use plastic bags, they now have too much single-use plastic packaging in their store, and we're asking them to reduce that. We also have a really cool campaign. Um, waste is out of fashion. A lot of the um, fashion industry, they knowingly make too many clothes, dispose of them. It's polluting, it's trashing, it gets back to this reduce, refuse imperative that we think is so important as we go forward. And I guess that's the last thing I would say is, while I truly cherish and believe in and promote recycling, I think in the coming year and years, we have to get back to the first word in that mantra, which is reduce. I read a, an article last year, maybe you saw it in the New Yorker about the whole, you know, gyre problem in the oceans and this marine biologist who's been studying plastics in the ocean for a while said, and I quote her, recycling has become the fig leaf for consumerism. And that brings us right back to this imperative of refuse, reduce, let's get to zero waste. And I can't wait to get there with you. And I'm going to, um, I'm sure there's a lot of resources. I'm going to put in the chat my Twitter handle, because as you might imagine, I have a lot of opinions and I express them there. Um, so I will put that there and then we can go to Q&A. <laughs> okay, thank you. You know, uh, legislation over lifestyle is kind of a, you know, I'm sitting here, am I going, is this a paradigm switch for me? Because I think we're so busy, especially stuck at home, maybe thinking about the things we can do there um, and actually making life simpler. But thank you for that. We've got great legislators in our area. So I guess it's just a matter of saying, keep up the good work. But thank you so much, Janet. Um, your leadership is very important. All three of you, your leadership is very important. And now we're going to uh, open up to uh, Q&A. Um, we've got a lot of questions. And as I think I mentioned, I also got some ahead of time. So I'm gonna be pulling from both. Um, many of you asked specific questions about what can and can't be recycled. And again, I'll go back to what Ben said. A reminder, re -smart, uh, RecycleSmartMA.org has all the answers. They have a thing called a Recyclopedia where you can check out what, what you can recycle. Um, okay, so. Like Carolyn, can I say something? Because this comes from a DEP Absolutely. resource also, which is one of the best stories that I've heard about Reduce. DEP has amazing resources and they, um, one of their programs, they advise businesses on how to reduce waste. And I went to one of their seminars and um, this uh, technician person said they went to a restaurant that was really struggling with the amount of waste that they produced each week. And it turned out one of their most, it was a burger place. And one of the most popular items on the menu was French fries. And one of the biggest, I can't remember the numbers of pounds, one of the biggest streams of waste was the potato peels because yeah. they were heavy and wet and they were just, you know, millions a day, whatever the number was. And this technician from DEP suggested, well, why don't you leave the peels on the potatoes? You want to talk about win-win. Everyone, all the customers were like raving. They tasted better. And then there was literally zero waste. And I just love that story because I feel like it's a metaphor. There are so many, you know, there's so many things hiding in plain sight, 
when I started talking about zero waste a decade ago, it sounded a little, you know, aspirational blue sky, but now there are so many examples like that. Um, and, and again, I just want to give DEP a shout out for having, you know, the kind of resources to offer us those great ideas. That's, that's brilliant. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, um, Eric, uh, here's one from a high school student. And um, he asks, do different types of plastics affect the environment differently? And actually something, you know, Ben, I'm sure you can sp speak in on this too. Now, Eric, I know you touched on this when you were talking about um, some plastics re reducing carbon emissions, but can you give some other examples of plastics that might affect the environment differently? I can. Um, I, I just first caveat. I'm 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 not a scientist. Um, our COO is really holds up that environmental science side of our um, team here at Preserve. But basically, I'll, I'll I'll say that we focused on polypropylene uh, because of our research with UMass Lowell, and when we were uh, in the you know in the business of recycling. A, a plastic, uh, we chose the most benign and polypro and high density polyethylene, possibly low density polyethylene are the most benign uh, plastics as, as it relates to, you know, the, the chemicals that are going into its makeup. Um, the chairman of the plastics engineering department at UMass Lowell, uh, you know, really steered us in this direction and felt that um, those were the materials that were the, the least impactful on the production side, the sourcing side. And if you're going to focus on the recycling of them, not that you're supporting their production or, uh, you know, the, whatever they create in making it, um, that's a material that's extremely useful and is more benign. It's also something that can be, uh, you know, uh, the FDA uh, is able to say it's able to house food. And I'll just also say this. So there's a lot of chat about sty uh, styrene. Again, um, I'm not a scientist, but I, I know that going into a styrene manufacturing plant is not a good time. And I don't want to spend, you know, my days going into a uh, recycling styrofoam plant or a, uh, anything that involves styrene. Um, but I've been in plenty of high density polyethylene and, high, and polypropylene recycling facilities. And I know how I feel when I walk out of them, I feel fine. Um, so I also would say that there's, you know, different levels of toxicity as it relates to uh, when these plastics go into landfills. And again, you know, fives and fours uh, rank as the, the, the best on that list compared to uh, many of the other plastics. And of course there's, you know, BPA scares, um, PFAS scares and what those are doing to, um, you know, your, your endocrine system, as well as potentially um, what's happening uh, on the other side as it relates to uh, moving into um, the second life or the death. Sorry, I'm reading this chat. Uh, polypropylene, sorry, is, poly, is PP number five and high density polyethylene is number two. Ben, do you have anything to add? No, from, from our standpoint, as a simple recycler, anything that we're not capturing for recycling, whether it's the LDP films, whether it's the, you know, multi-layered or multi, you know, bunch of plastics all mixed together that's not making it in. I'm, I'm, I'm like you, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a scientist. I'm just looking at the simple things, the materials that we are currently removing from the recycle stream, putting them back into the marketplace, I think is some type beneficial. What's not getting recycled is the stuff that's still out there that we need to uh, we need to look at and we need to work on. Can I just, Carolyn? Can I just add on also as it relates to to plant based? I mean, we we do believe that we can be in a place with PHA where um, you know the high school student doesn't need to ask that question in the sense that um, you know it could be called something else, it could be called plantics. Um, but it can be proven out that toxicity in this uh, this plant-based product is like a plant. And that's where we want to go. And I also just want to harken back to, to Janet's point that they're, they're one of the, the, the reasons that we have hope and faith and one of the changes that we think we need to see is we need to see 
changes in perception and behavior amongst consumers, preservers, we like to call them. Um, Carolyn, let's go back, not go back to 1948. Sorry if it was Janet or Carolyn, I forget. But, but we need to look at and say, we shouldn't be, work, we shouldn't be requiring of a single use product, something that lasts for hundreds, and two, hundreds of years. So why does a fork that's used to eat a salad need to last that long? So let's create a fork that lasts for that use if it has to and have it be as low or reusable, right? So we all carry our silverware around, that's fantastic too. But if it is a single use and on the go, create it from something that is not gonna be around forever and is completely benign when you're done with it and also has a lower greenhouse gas completely in its full life cycle. And, and that's, that's kind of a key goal, that's a high bar. Um, and I just wanna emphasize what I'm, what I'm getting at is when a, when a consumer uses a plant-based fork, they have to know it's not a styrene fork. It's not a polypropylene fork and it's going to behave differently. So we really, you know, we, we want to have faith in preservers, consumers that they can be at a point where they're like, okay, this isn't behaving like that styrene fork because it's not going to last for 50 years. It's not going to find its way to the ocean. It's not going to be harmful to animals. When I testify on these issues, I say, let's make disposable a dirty word. Yeah. Okay. Well, Janet, um, you mentioned uh, the production of plastic and here's a question. What is the status of producer responsibility in reducing plastic waste rather than shifting the burden to the consumer? And maybe more specifically, there was another question, what's the status of the Break Free from Plastic Federal Act? Yeah, that's gonna be fun. That just got filed last year um, in February, I believe, or late March. Um, and so really this is our first full session. That is, so the break free from plastic bill was filed in Congress. Yeah. And uh, you know, we're hundred percent nonpartisan. So I'm not saying this from a partisan standpoint, I'm saying it from a um, realistic standpoint. Last session, I think it was filed uh, as much to kind of get the message out and set some conversations around these issues. This session, there's going to be actual legislative push for it. So it's brand new. You know, I don't like to predict what happens in any legislative body, but I think there will be a push. Are we, you know, weeks or months away from that bill passing? I would doubt it. But is there going to be a real, you know, legislative campaign for it in Congress? Yes. In Massachusetts, we just filed a state producer responsibility bill. And by the way, I think the best example in our everyday life of producer responsibility is the bottle bill, the deposit law, because producers are responsible as you, um, as that container's life cycle goes. So even though it doesn't get characterized that way, I think the bottle bill is a producer responsibility bill, but we have a separate producer responsibility bill filed this year and, um, and a lot of support for it already, just in the drafting of it. Um, so. I'm hoping that, I am hoping for the best. I feel like this state legislative session, I feel like there's some new people, there's some new energy um, and we're all, I don't wanna say getting used to doing this on Zoom, but you know, we're not thrown on our heels like we were in April and May and June last year of like, how do, what do I, you know, who do I, how do I talk to anybody? Um, so I'm looking forward and I, and again, please, I'll put my email in the, in the, uh, in the chat or the Q and A, but please feel free to contact me offline to get involved in any of these campaigns. Great, okay. Um, so Ben, maybe this one goes your way. Uh, here's this question. What's up with the plastic bag recycling at some grocery stores? Are those actually usefully recycled or is it more of a public relations effort? It's a big mystery. Yeah. That, um Again, I'm not. I don't. I don't do that type of work in in, yeah. my, in, in, in my daily job. Um, I do know that the majority. There's been a time when it was more of a public relations than it was a recycling thing. Okay, bring your bag back. We'll put them in this big thing, and we'll and we'll ship them off. Uh, in, in in today's environment, I think there's a lot more demand for that type of material 
Um, I think I just read somewhere that Trex has done a deal with with some of the um, some of the bags that are coming back into the grocery stores that they're trying to use. But again, you end up with with multi material, different types of plastic. They're not all the single use bags that we get from Market Basket. You go to Target, you might get a different type of plastic in their bag. So if, if they're all collected, they have to be sorted. And I think that that was where the biggest issue was in the past is separating those materials the same as, as it is in our operation, separating the different types of plastic and making it work. I'm sure that Janet would have, has a different different spin on this. And uh, she's probably more in tune to what's going on than I am on that end of it. Janet? <laughs> yeah, let's not... Let's not figure out how to recycle things we shouldn't have in the first place, I guess, is the way that I would say it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's funny because in Acton, we have banned uh, single-use plastic bags, but I noticed that those plastic, can, you know, collectors are still filled with bags. Yeah. Okay. Let me just jump. There's one of the things that Janet and I might agree on is that the plastic bags, if they end up in our system, cause a, a tremendous amount of downtime. They wrap around our screens. We don't want to see them. So from that standpoint, we just as soon not have them around. So we do agree on that to some extent. Okay. So listen, a real quickie, Ben. Does any, or again, any of you, does anyone in Massachusetts keep data about the rates of recycling in individual towns? And if so, how can we get that data? I believe that's a, a Mass DEP, Department of Environmental Protection, gets all of that. All municipalities are supposed to report into Mass DEP. Um, I know that there's that they have a rating on the different communities and how much they recycle. So I, I don't I don't know where it is on the website. Okay. Uh, you could probably contact John Fisher or Brooke Nash or somebody, and they should be able to tell what what municipality is is. Um, the, vo the volume or the percentage that they're recycling. Good. Your, okay. your own city or town public works should also, I mean, if you just want to know your own city or town, mm -hmm. the public works department, I would think would Bo know that. Yeah, public works or board of health or yeah, health yeah. agent. Yep. Okay. So a general question, uh, and this is from, uh, I guess, a group of college students, maybe, I don't know. What advice would you, any panelists, offer to student action groups wanting to get their high school or college campuses involved in similar initiatives, especially in the context of COVID, as we have lost a lot of ground on this front. We have very active, we're not in the high schools, uh, but we have very active college campuses. And so I could connect you with people and we have like, 13 official chapters and then clubs at another dozen or 15 college campuses in Massachusetts around the state. And by the way, they're going great. Students are so, they figured, you know, of course, no surprise, they figured out how to do everything they wanted to do digitally within about five minutes. Unlike me, which is like, where's share screen, you know, so. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh can I make a plug for an organization uh, called Plan Post Landfill Action, Action Network? Uh, originated in um, University of New Hampshire, and they, you know, have evolved to the point. Their 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 claim to fame is realizing that they can um, take, be there to receive furniture that kids are throwing away as they exit the system at the end of the school year, hold that furniture in a warehouse and resell it at a lower price so the kids coming in the next year. So that was their, their claim to fame, but now they're like a full consultancy that helps universities with sustainability initiatives nationwide. Wow. Could you put that on the uh, chat? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Um, can I just say one more, th one thing about plastic bags? Of I just want to say like someone said it, so it's all crap. Um, I don't think it's all crap. I think that, um, you know, obviously single use plastic bags should not be used because we should all have reusable bags. Bottom line is everybody doesn't do that, right? Other than, you know, everybody on this call and plastic bags, the single use plastic bags use less resources than a paper bag manufacturing process. And the plastic bags that we've tra tracked through, not, not each individual bag, but as Ben was saying, it's utilized for a lot of plastic lumber production. 
And someone could look at that from an environmental standpoint and say, actually, a plastic lumber deck is a hell of a lot more environment friendly than a wood deck that needs to be painted with, uh, you know, paints that uh, need to resist the weather for many, many years. So there's definitely an argue, uh, you know, an environmental balance that's that's looked at when you look at the the full life cycle of that. Okay, well, um, it is 810 and we, we're going to try to be as um, faithful to ending it at 815. And so um, we have just enough time for one very quick response from each of you, ho hopefully to end on a positive note. And that is, what gives you hope at this point around plastic? Okay. I'd be happy to start. Uh, what gives me hope around, I mean, it gives me hope around a lot of things is, is, um, is, a, is a whole other story of just sort of business and sustainability and carbon neutral and coming out of COVID. Uh, I do think a lot of businesses and a lot of entities are going to come out stronger. I think we've learned a lot how to uh, sustain and survive. I think, uh, you know, consumption has certainly gone up during COVID, which is a drag as it relates to home consumption. Um, but our impact has gone down as it relates to emissions globally. And I hope that so many cities, countries are able to look around and say, wow, isn't that nice to have a clear sky? Let's figure out how to come out of this crisis stronger. Um, but as it relates to plastic, I would just say, I, I do have a lot of faith that we're going to evolve in the, the uh, making of materials that are substitutes for plastics. Let's not call them plastics. I mean, I once heard that a candle is plastic. So, I mean, plastic has sort of been all this, 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 you know, this broad term. But I have faith that we're going to develop more and more materials that are benign, that are made from plants, that we're able to construct without induct, in, inducing harmful chemicals or toxins, and that can be, um, you know, beneficial to our planet at, at its end of life. Okay, thank you. You can be polite or I can call on you. <laughs> ben? <laughs> well, I, I, I guess from my standpoint, again, very simplistic part of this is that we need outlets for the materials that we, we collect and that we process. And as we start to see more interest in purchasing recycled plastics and turning them into an, another product or even turning them into the same product again and again and again, as we start to get materials approved for food grade um, or, or human uh, touching of, of materials, uh, I look at that as a positive. If we're gonna, if we, if we're not gonna eradicate all plastics off the face of the earth, they're still gonna be made. As a consumer, we look for plastics to bring home, uh, bring things home from the store. From my standpoint, I hope that we continue to develop outlets for these materials different markets for these materials, kind of following up a little bit on what Eric said, that's important to me. And until we get to a point where we're, we're generating a different type of material. Thank you. And Janet. Yeah, I think uh, without sounding like a homework card, I my, what gives me hope is young people. Um, I already talked a moment ago about the college students that I work with, but I saw a documentary over the summer um, about a fifth grade class in Brooklyn. I think it was called Microplastic Madness, if I'm remembering properly. Um, and basically, like these fifth graders took it upon themselves, you know, to get their burrow to, I mean, the, whether you look at the um, the straws movement, you know, started by young kids, I mean, I just have hope that the young people are ready to take it all on. They're doing it and they're our future. That's my hope. Yeah. So be it. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much, Janet, Ben, and Eric. We really appreciate it. Thank you for informing us and inspiring us to possibilities for action and a lot of things to think about. And I also want to thank the audience for uh, being here. And I apologize that we weren't able to get to all your questions. We are going to put on... Um, some sources for you that were put on it on the chat at the beginning. If you want to, you know, we're, we're finished. It's 815. 
But if you want to just stick on for a few minutes and maybe take a screenshot of these uh, resources, feel free to. So again, Janet, Ben, Eric, thank you so much. Thank you very much, thank Carolyn. You. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. Good evening. <laughs>